Today's episode is brought to you by Idle Courses Academy. If you're looking to transition into the corporate instructional design space, you need the right guidance to do so. Dr. Robin Sargent and her team have done an amazing job with focusing on what's important to be a corporate instructional designer, like storyboarding, ID models and theories, interviewing SMEs, creating in storyline, and project management tactics. They even cover how to make your resume and portfolio stand out from the crowd and have an impressive completion rate with their students working at organizations like Google, Salesforce, GM, Uber, and Amazon. You can actually hear more about these from Robin's episode on this podcast, which is episode number 26. So if you are more serious about becoming an instructional designer or looking to further develop your ID skills, I would highly encourage you to check out Idle. Sign up with the link in the show notes today and tell her that I sent you over there. And now let's get this episode started. Hello, everyone, and welcome on into the nerdiest podcast you're going to hear today. My name is Dr. Luke Hobson. I'm a senior instructional designer and program manager at MIT. I also have my own blog, podcast, YouTube channel, and courses all about instructional design. My purpose is to help you make the online learning experience meaningful for you and for your students. And you can find all my information over at drlukehobson.com. Speaking of websites, my wife and I have been diligently working on a new website for the book, which means that I owe you an update. The ebook has been written and it has been edited. I decided to call it What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer. I wrote the book based off of questions from people like you, and those became the chapters. If the title sounds familiar, well, it's because it was based upon the blog, podcast, and YouTube uh, episode that was all about this exact same topic. Going back in time, giving myself career advice, what would I say in order to really try to help me accelerate my career growth? And that's what this book really ended up becoming. And Dr. Carl Kopp, he actually called it a roadmap and talking about how to essentially navigate your instructional design career. Some of the chapters, what they look like, well, they include what does an instructional designer do? What are the pros and cons of instructional design? What kind of instructional designer do I want to be when I grow up? Where do I see myself five years from now? How do I teach myself a new skill? How do I build a portfolio? And many other chapters, 18 in total, to really help you out with navigating your instructional design career. A humongous thank you to Jen Abbott, who helped me with editing this book uh, as quickly as possible, too. The timeline was absolutely insane, and she was just so fast and helpful for me. Cannot recommend her enough if you are looking for an editor. Of course, if she has the bandwidth to do so, but she was absolutely wonderful to work with. And I just mentioned him, but once again, I have to give a humongous thank you also to Dr. Carl Kopp, who read everything also at the speed of light and wrote the forward for the book and just said so many kind and incredible things about it. So just absolutely so pumped to be able to share this with you soon. The manuscript is actually now in the hands of my designer. Since this is going to be an ebook, I want it to look perfect, so I did hire a professional to really help me out with everything. Something that I wasn't expecting is that uh, a lot of you want to pre-order this book, which absolutely means the world to me, by the way. So thank you even for just considering to do this. And I'm currently working on the back end, trying to get this up and running for you to give you the option to do so. I hope to have this done within a day or so, and as soon as it's ready, I'm going to blast out a link to everyone as far as for how to pre-order it, find the link, and uh, and everything else of a sort. Once it's all said and done, I'm hoping the book will be live within a week or two, kind of giving myself a little bit of a buffer. It should be done actually within five days, but knowing how things work with websites and setting up different pages and blah, blah, blah. There's usually some additional stuff in the back end. You don't really realize it until you start testing it and you're like, oh, I need to write the copy for this or, oh, I need to change this link or whatever. So I'm hoping within a week or two, this is going to be out there. I'm certainly going to be keeping you updated every step of the way. If you're in Instructional Design Institute community, you'll definitely receive my update inside of our Facebook group. So join that one if you haven't yet already. And of course, through the mailing list and other different forms of social media, I'll be sure to update you. 
And some of you have mentioned to me about how you've been enjoying hearing about this monthly progress of the book, just giving you these updates. And maybe you're considering writing a book yourself, which is, I'm guessing is probably why you kind of like this whole insider knowledge about how I've been putting a book together with, and only, actually, it's been six months officially. So the book from start to finish is going to be done in six months. So if you were curious about just how I did this, uh, let me know. Maybe I'll make something like a YouTube video or a podcast episode or uh, something on just how I did this in six months without losing my sanity while still working essentially, you know, two full time jobs and still being a husband and uh, dog dad <laughs> and everything else as well. OK, but that's enough of the update. Let's talk about today's episode. As instructional designers, we should be using data to help inform our decisions when it comes to designing the learning experience for our courses and for our programs. Data can tell us so much about our students with their learning behaviors, the learning analytics, and even just basic instructional design principles. How do we interpret this data correctly, though? That is certainly the biggest question. One compelling case on how to do this is called educational data mining, or commonly referred to in the industry as EDM. To educate us on this approach, we are joined today by Smurdy Sadarshan. She's an e-learning training specialist at LinkedIn, and she is about to become your go-to person, your tour guide, if you will, all throughout data, and really just how we can learn from it, what are the main takeaways, and everything of a sort. I am not going to take up any more time. Here is the one and only Smurdy Sudarshan. Smurdy, welcome to the podcast. Hey. Oh, hey, Luke. Thanks for inviting me on this. Absolutely. I am so glad that you are here because you are bringing on some expertise that we haven't talked about at all yet on the podcast somehow in the 30 something plus episodes. The entire concept of data has not been explored to the depth that we're going to be doing today. So really excited to have you come on and share everything you know about that with us. But before I get ahead of myself for the folks at home, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit more about your background, who you are, and what it is that you do. Oh, yeah. Um, so I am uh, an e-learning training specialist, and I work for LinkedIn. Uh, so basically, this role was kind of opened up because of the fact that LinkedIn wanted to explore e-learning. And uh, they didn't have any self-directed courses. As you've seen, LinkedIn Learning, it's just like videos, videos, videos. So uh, they really wanted to explore the e-learning bit of it. And uh, there's me and one more teammate of mine. So both of us work for LinkedIn as e-learning training specialists. So we specialize only in the e-learning aspect and the digital learning aspect. Fantastic. And as somebody who, like, I love LinkedIn, like that has somehow become my jam. So the fact that you worked on LinkedIn is so <laughs> awesome. But when people talk about social media platforms, they're like, you know, like, which ones do you use? And like, I have to use all of them because it's just unfortunate that like, you need to be on everything all the time. But if I had just one preference, I'm like, just let me go on LinkedIn. That's, that's my home. That's my bread and butter. Like I like LinkedIn more than anything else. So the fact that we can explore and kind of like talk more like under the hood and talk shop about this with LinkedIn is really cool. So like, mm -hmm. I am super excited <laughs> to talk more about everything. But speaking of all of this, what we're going to be talking about this evening is educational data mining or EDM. And we're going to obviously get into that this evening. But for some of the folks at home, I know that there are just a couple of different definitions that we really should go over before mm -hmm. diving into too much, because if not, I fear that we might lose some people along the way. So I just want to start with the basics. Can you just give us a general overview of just data mining itself? Yeah. Uh, okay, so is it okay if I can take you through an example as of here? Like, yes, please do. So, what happens usually in a classroom or in any kind of ILT or VILT training is that you sometimes they have their camera on, but then usually in a classroom when you're actually on a uh, face to face platform, so there uh, you can see your learner's facial expressions. So where, like, say, when your lecture is getting boring or when your content is getting boring. So basically, what do you do? You either throw a piece of chalk or if they're yawning, then you <laughs> just give them a pop quiz and you say that, OK, this is your pop quiz. This is a surprise quiz. You, got, you guys got to attend everything right now. So that's the kind of facial expressions that you can gauge uh, while you're there on a face-to-face -face, uh, or while you're there on an ILT 
on on field but what happens when you come online so the only thing that the learner is interacting is with your computer and how do you measure that so there is one measurement term in that case which is called as the digital footprints and those are similar to how your um, learners expressions are so for example if i take amazon um so amazon has really good tracking uh, footprints on their website because if you see you go and add something to the cart the next time when you come up on amazon you have that same product or similar products popping in on your uh, website or on your page right so similarly even netflix as well so i love horror movies so whenever i go and click on a horror movie the next time when it says that the next you want to watch or movies you would like to watch would be like all the horror movies that come up on uh, netflix so similar to that what we are doing here is that um, we are going to track the digital footprints of a learner and which is either on an lms or any kind of classroom you might say or any ms education or anything as such uh, which is mostly digital and that digital footprint is what is put in the database we analyze those footprints and get in a model uh, a learner model as such like how exactly learners behave uh while they are on your course so for example if say uh companies do have this uh, compliance courses which <laughs> employees have to take it forcefully and then they just go on clicking next 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 until you get to the quiz right so what happens during that is that so each page that you uh, scroll or each click that you do is just for one second so that's where where we analyze like if there are 10 learners on that course then if all the 10 learners are just doing like 10 second or one one second click over there there we analyze that okay this course is not engaging enough so we better got to change our strategy or we better got to change something else on there so similar to that is your edm so now what we have done is that we have collected the data we have put it in the database and we have created a learner model so how is this learner model created is by mining the data so mining the data means like uh you know how exactly do you go to a query and mine a uh, coal or you go and mine quartz or any kind of metal similar to that imagine you have numbers in there and uh, imagine you have like tables in there so or some kind of a schematic representation so that is something you got to analyze and then that is something that you got to mine so that is known as your data mining now to add to that educational data mining is where you collect or mine the learners data that you have collected on your lms or on your lrs or lor wherever that is on your uh, you know um, digital digitally wherever you are tracking them is where you collect that data and you analyze that in order to get that behavior model so that is known as your edm that was perfect i was going to ask you more questions on definitions and you answered literally all of them so thank you for that very well, well done explanation about all of that also random side note i love that when you buy something on amazon like i just bought uh, a a new uh, door lock the other day and now it's non stop suggestions of recommended products about buying door locks <laughs> and i was like please stop <laughs> like i i only needed one and now all of a sudden it's this like oh you need all of them and i'm like oh okay well i wish there was a way to give feedback but that's fine it's for another day but that's not what we're talking about just random side note o- over there now the other question i want to ask you about all of this is that this seems like it should be mainstream I feel like everyone should know about this, how to do this, but I know that for a lot of instructional designers out there, it's not a part of their kind of everyday routine or a part of the process. We say that it is. We are collecting feedback, we are analyzing, you know, we are doing everything. But then I hear from a lot of people that they're never really able to go and then implement this later on or perhaps for the next run, the next year or the next, you know, whatever it is. Why hasn't this become a mainstream part of course design yet? I think mostly because of the fact that uh, as far as I know, uh in L&D, uh, what we have been doing is that we are kind of um having courses or designing curriculums pretty intuitively and not letting the data do the speaking. so this is something that i've seen even here uh, like you know most of the companies or most of the educational institutions that i've seen and consulted with i've seen them doing it more on an intuitive basis so there was one educational institution that i consulted and they were having a dtp process that is the design thinking process 
they were giving out the design thinking process so uh, very intuitively like in terms of like just having 90 hour session uh, and i think they had like 90 minutes or 60 minute session per week and the students were there online and they they just had to attend like one and a half hour of those sessions and they would be put in breakout rooms and activities and so on and so forth but the point is that they never analyzed that they were supposed to have it in a more interactive fashion like by giving mostly like business case scenarios and like those mini challenges or like scenario based learning where they have like branching scenarios and then you know you got to select each one of them and then at the end of the day you get some uh, you know uh, analysis and sorts, sorts. So this was something that they kind of developed it very intuitively. And uh, even if they, even if the data told them not to do so, they did it so because they felt it was right to do it, and they felt they knew the learners better than, uh, <laughs> than data knew the learners. So I think that is the reason why it's not kind of become mainstream as of now. But I think I have seen in corporate learners at least, I've seen it becoming, there's a gradual shift. It's slow, but it's happening. But in educational institutions, it's still there. The rigidity is still there in terms of why are we supposed to use this data? I mean, we are teachers. We know our learners better. Why, why are we supposed to use data for just, you know, uh, uh, understanding the process and then telling them, you know, you need that, you need this and all of that. So I think that rigidity is something that we need to um, uh, let go of. Yeah, I absolutely agreed. I know that I have been over here clamoring now for forever about why aren't we doing pilot programs more, which is something that like has become a part of my normal routine is to now for, for every course that I do design every product uh, program that I'm launching, there has to be some pilot version because I want the data. Yeah. That's what's so important to me is that I've, I have already experienced the failure of thinking that I know what learners are going through and then come to find out, hey, I was wrong and I could make something better. So I learned about that a while ago and I was like, whoops, okay, now I'm just going to make this a part of my process to make sure that my learners are going through what I actually am expecting them, what I'm really am trying to design around. I'm hoping they get this experience out of it, but perhaps really they're not. So I was served my slice of humble pie years ago. So now it's a part of what I do. But for what you were just talking about, I know that some people really don't like change and reading data and making this a part of the routine is it's a big thing from the individual level, but also more from an organizational stance. So what, in your opinion, is an effective approach to try to make some of our key decision makers within our organization adopt everything with the idea of EDM? Mm. I think that's a really good question. Um, I can answer in terms of um, corporate learners because I've had a pretty good uh, understanding about the corporate learners. So what happens with corporate learners is that they require something much on the go. So I think in the L&D aspect of it, uh, the instructional designers or maybe like say uh, a course developer or a content developer uh, as such can get this data. So this is something that they need to ingrain like the data driven approaches. So there's one example like case study, which I can give you like the previous company I was working with. Uh, they were into a lot of this, uh, you know, like B2C customers were what they were handling. And uh, those C customers were uh, kind of getting these professional uh, certified courses uh, at the end of the day when they take up this, um, uh, you know, whatever self-learning course that we used to give them. So uh, what happened there was that we had like, I think 250 page, just click next um, uh, self-learning course which was uh, which had everything to do with uh, you know one particular product of that company and that was something which uh, which the data when we brought in and then the net promoter score that was brought in it said that no one is going to get certified <laughs> and typically no one is actually getting certified because that certification costed like 250 dollars and if they just take our uh, you know the self learning or whatever they are taking uh, as of now, they would never clear the exam because they just had clicking next. It was just like a textbook approach that they had in there. And plus, we had to invest more on our virtual trainings because they wouldn't understand what was given in the self-learning. That was there. So when we brought in that data and when we brought in that uh, net promoter score to our content developers, then they understood the fact that, okay, this is dropping because of the fact that we were giving them a lot of next buttons over in there. So why don't we do one thing? We change our strategy. Uh, we give them a visual menu. Uh, we give them five different lessons. Uh, each lesson has one learning path. 
and uh, that path takes you to one course which is much more interactive like they had like few videos in there they had thrown in some inline checks and then they also gamified something in the end uh, which had a jeopardy game uh, and uh, they said that instead of having them go through uh, the uh, entire course once again the summative assessment was in the terms of uh, a jeopardy game and uh, the entire certification course was i think they had a exam workshop or something and that workshop is where they had this exam blueprint and they created all of that so i think this data should be really made available to the content developers instructional designers and the learning consultants before anyone else gets hold of this because they are the ones who kind of strategize everything and then they know what to do with that data much better yeah absolutely and in like to me it was always like the proof was in the pudding that what i can go and i could show that or i can like i can give them be like look at what we did like look at the feedback that's when people are like ah oh, got it <laughs> we shouldn't we need to do this more it's just like yes like why are we doing this more so that's awesome thank you for sharing all of those examples so let's say right now i'm an instructional designer i'm going to assume that before i dive into copious amounts of data because like as anyone knows like the behind the scenes with everything for an lms or any learning platform there is this so much data that you can collect by the run by the year six months the individual you know whatever it possibly is so i'm just going to assume that i need to have a strategy of what i'm going to be doing first before i just kind of just throw myself in there and kind of figure it out so if my goal is really like step one is which is going to be um like for learning behaviors for instance like where do i begin how do i really start this entire process so i think the first uh way to begin this process would be to understand the different kinds of online learners so there was an age where we would understand like you know what are like learners are like you had like seven learners i guess like audio visual learners kinesthetic learners and all of that so there were those learners we would kind of analyze them and we would provide just content and teaching material just for them but now it's kind of changed to the online learner aspect wherein there's just like five kinds of learners as of now on online and uh, the most uh, fickle minded or you can say like the most explore uh, i mean the most adventurous among them would be the uh, uh, exploratory learners who kind of explore each course on your lms and drop off at one point and they would just go and then explore another course and then they would drop off at another point so this is uh, so these are the kind of um, this is the kind of i think the starting point should be this is to understand how exactly your target audience is and what kind of learner do they fit into so if you are catering to like say uh, an um, Uh, for example if i have to say an audio learner so audio learners basically who uh, tends to hear a lot and learn a lot so in that way if most of your target audience for that uh, is supposed to be an audio learner then you say that you give them a lot of podcasts and then just say like you can give them an uh, uh, you know an inline check in there and then later on just go ahead and give another podcast and then just give another inline check but again this is a very simplified way of saying it but uh, yeah so the strategy can change according to what your uh, learners needs are so i think the first step would be definitely to determine who your online learner is and then go about uh, strategizing so in that way you would not make your uh, uh, content uh, specific to you or you're not designing intuitively but you're designing keeping the learners in mind so basically you would be uh, turning into a learner centric design rather than uh, being an intuitive designer And it's really fascinating about all of that too because I've learned over the years to also try to think about things more about learner preferences as far as for like you don't know what you need. You know, you might think that really you do learn from auditory but then maybe I can convince you otherwise, which has been kind of my goal as I'm like, nah, you don't really learn in one style. Like I <laughs> bet I can show you a bunch of different ways and you're going to be able to learn if I design things in the appropriate manner, you know, yeah. if it's coming down. And and one of the things that you mentioned when I mentioned to you about like an appropriate manner is that you also talked about in your blog post talking more about like the the sequences in the patterns as far as for what learners are introduced to and I've kind of found like my own pattern that works well with like how I design like just even just a module not even a full uh you know it could be a full week or it could be a little snippet where it's always like the introductory the reading goes to a video goes yeah. to a practice question goes to a video it's like I have it kind of laid out like these different types of 
of uh, blocks with your uh, research and everything you've gone through. Have you found something similar like that, of like a certain sequence of how you want that structured in, in the course itself? Uh, the main thing with EDM is that there is no structure. So the structure is ah. on the learner. <laughs> so ah. it depends on how your learner wants it. So if, uh, okay, so let me give you this example again. So we had this thing uh, wherein uh, we had this very great, brilliant idea of gamifying a content for field developers. And those field developers were the ones who would take calls online and they would kind of rectify uh, the customers uh, in on on the field. So basically, what what would happen was that if there was a troubleshooting uh, ticket that would come to you, like troubleshooting ticket, as in like any issue that would come, a customer would say that you know I have an issue with my laptop. Just go ahead and fix it. So example. So uh, what we would do is that uh, the uh, field developers would call them, and then they would ask them and say that like what is the issue, and they would troubleshoot the issue. In, in and on the call itself, or they would share the screen and they would troubleshoot the issue. So we had this really brilliant idea. <laughs> I don't know where we got this idea from. We thought we would gamify their content because it was really good. The content was really nice. And we thought like, okay, let's just go ahead and gamify it and give it to them. We had like all game mechanics in there, progress bar scores and all of that. But the kind of satisfaction that we got, the NPS, the net promoter score that we got from the uh, field customers and field reviewers was that, we really don't like this course because it was really strenuous for them to clear each level of the course uh, and then give a solution to the customer. Uh, that was like being really, uh, you know, uh, that was like really being, uh, you know, I don't know what, it was not kind of going with their job, what they were doing. Plus they needed training, which was like, you know, they just have this training document. They pick that training document and they say that, okay, this is the solution. This is the training. Okay, now I've learned it just because I've solved the case. So it's mostly like on the job training and on the go training that we used to do. So what we did was that when we got the score and then, you know, when the data said that, you know, they're not happy and, and stuff like that, we went back to the stakeholders and we said that, see, they're not actually happy with the scores. I mean, with the course, you may want to change it to something much more simpler, like a micro learning or, you know, just maybe just providing them a job aid, uh, you know, just to help their job because they know everything. It's not that they don't know anything. And game is something that you're starting like introduction and then you clear one level and then there's a mission, you clear this mission and then finally you win a badge. So it's just that they just need one job aid and I don't think much is needed for them. Uh, I mean, maybe you could just eliminate the entire uh, gamified content. But since a lot of investment had gone into it already, like creating the game and then strategizing the game and all of that. So since a lot of investment had gone into it, they could not completely get rid of it. But what they did was the target audiences kind of changed. So the target audiences for gamified content would be the new hires who would come in to like just college graduates who would come in and who just want to learn the job. So that was where they were introduced to the gamified content. But then people who already knew the job and then they were into the job like for two years, three years, we just provided them with a job aid and like few micro learnings for like 15, 20 minutes, wherein they could just take the call, go through that micro learning and give a solution on the spot. So with that, what happened was that the number of tickets, uh, tickets as in they keep a count of tickets when each uh, troubleshooting uh, situation is solved. So the number of tickets uh, that was getting resolved were much greater. So because they were using this training content, it was much greater. And also the retention rate for the new hires was much higher. So since they were playing a game as soon as they came in and then they, they already knew, they didn't know what was there. But then the gamified content saw, sort of taught them the entire process of what exactly happens during that troubleshooting. So I think in that way, the data worked out pretty well for us. So just to say that, you know, how exactly it works and uh, uh, for each one of them. So I think in a way, there is no pattern as such. So even if there is a pattern, the pattern that can be formed is your online model or your online learner model. So what do I mean by learner model is that how exactly do you um, see your target audience as? So what different learners are there and how can you cater to them universally? So again, this, this again can be a little bit... Uh, 
uh, tricky uh, in terms when you're you know on a global scale and then uh, you know you are uh, you know situated on different countries and all of that but it does help uh, like we had a huge problem with just global english where in a uh, few places i think in latin america and even africa or somewhere is some places in asia as well they couldn't understand that english so customization and localization became very um, you know helpful over there and this kind of uh, we understood this by the heap model because in those three places there there was no one who was taking that course and uh, since it was english only course but then it was a mandatory course uh, they had to take just to learn their job so this is something that we figured out using their data and uh, we invested in localization in that that that's really interesting. It, it reminds me too of one of the programs that um, we developed for three D printing, where we found that the people who were taking it, the target audience, as you were talking about, is that really we could clearly define the folks into three different personas. Where yeah. we had those who were like the the super engineers. This is three D printing is their life. It's exactly what they do. Then you have those who are the novices, where they're like, oh, I'm kind of I'm kind of <laughs> curious. I want to like dip my toes into here, and maybe this is where the future's going. I'm just gonna get a jump start now. And then we had other people who are more of like the finance perspective, where they're like, well, my organization is gonna start doing three D printing. I need to understand this more and talk about the cost and analysis, and is this right for my organization? So naturally, we couldn't fit the content for those people the same way it doesn't work they're very very different people all within the same course and we ended up doing a type of like choose your own adventure basically is what happened so it's just like you have like different tracks essentially where it's like oh you're going to go down like the the super nitty gritty rabbit hole of 3d printing you're on like the expert track (laughs) if you're just learning to learn more about uh, costs we're going to be using these business models and talking about the finances like you're going down this track and and that's how we made it work within our own lms and that's everything your story reminded me of and that's that's what ended up happening. So going back to basically just disproving myself from three minutes ago, the sequences were not true. <laughs> They're not the same way. <laughs> they had to be customized. So thank you for mentioning that as I uh, default back to not going that direction. So that is actually really funny, but super true. You know, this is, by the way, folks, we record this and we just run it live. If you're wondering, that is true. We do. <laughs> <laughs> so for this then, and, and talking more about everything when it comes to um, data. So now we talked a little bit more about everything from uh, the behaviors. We talked about the sequences. We talked about all these different things. So after the data has been collected, I know that we are going to have to access reports with learning analytics, supposedly, if our platform has it. If not, then we'll, we'll digress to that a little bit later on. But suppose that it does produce different types of reports that we really can use. Uh, how does somebody who might potentially be a novice about this. How does somebody correctly read and try to interpret this data uh, as far as we're trying to be able to think about next steps? Because I know that sometimes when you initially read it, you might have one idea about what to do, but then in actuality, it's it's a lie. <laughs> you should be doing something else. So how do you read this correctly first? So yeah, that's actually a pretty interesting question. Um, so this is what, uh, uh, you know, there is one um, design that comes into picture when you're reading uh, the data. That's nothing but your data-driven learning design. So what happens in data-driven learning design is that it's basically a cyclic process. So say first you get the reports, uh, or even if you even if you monitor, uh, like say for one, two months, your like your course, is, course has just launched and uh, you're just monitoring your entire course. So that goes into the monitoring phase. So once you monitor your course, then you get you go to the reporting phase of it. So in the reporting phase is where most of them can kind of get confused, uh, wherein like which report to pull, what to pull and how to do it and, you know, stuff like that. So that is where that is where this learning design comes into picture, wherein we kind of have a rubric. Um, So it's kind of plugged in uh, to the system or if not, this is like a very basic version, what I'm saying, a rubric. If not a rubric, then you can actually have just one. um, So they do have something known as natural language processing, uh, wherein which kind of reads your entire data online. So if you're saying that your learner is dropping off at this time, at this second, or what desktop are they using? So uh, if they're using desktop, tablet, or mobile devices, or uh, if I have to say how much percentage of each course have they completed? So if uh, I'm talking about one set of learners and they've just completed like 33% of it, 
like why is it that all learners are just completing 33% of this course and uh, even if i say that in a gamified content it does create a leaderboard right but on the leaderboard what happens is that the nlp language gives you real time data so when you take that real time data you know at exactly what point with student what they're doing so if i say like uh, say i have student 1 student 2 so student 1 uh, gets it uh, gets the question or, or clears the uh, um, level at say uh, the 5th second or the 45th second but uh, the student 3 clears the level at like say 60th second or the you know 65th second or something like that so this difference between them is pretty huge like if learner one uh, is clearing it like say 40th second and this one is clearing it at 60th second why is there a 20 second gap and also there are times what has happened is that it goes into minutes so if learner uh, if learner one has like say 30 he has spent he or she has spent like 31 minutes on one level but learner two has spent like say just 15 minutes on one level like why is there so much of a vast difference between them spending each one of you know the time at each level so this is all the real time data that you can take but uh, but again there's a uh, but there's a little um, trick to how you can do that uh, on any one of your authoring tool you just have to enable the lms and then the tracking part of it and you have something known as x api or tin can api which was previously called so experience api so this kind of helps us track the footprint that i was talking about the learning part of it and that is where you uh, get uh, where you can pull that data and you can analyze them in the reports so again reports is a little bit of um, you know mostly our lnd consultant and our id a uh, job kind of gets tricky while you're getting into the numbers and the rows part of it but once you get into the routine of it and just analyzing the data like the drop off rate or even if i say that you know the timing part of it and even if it even if i get a dashboard of how exactly the learners are learning i think that should pretty much be it i mean we don't have to uh, you know go in depth into what it says until and unless you're very interested in what exactly data has to tell you but that's where the reporting comes into picture and then comes the design so depending on what your report say is where you're going to design so if you are designing your learning objectives or you want to kind of pivot and then say that i want to change my learning strategy now because you know the learners are not engaged now but i need to change my learning strategy so that's where your uh, design phase comes in and from design again you go to monitor report design monitor report design so it's a very cyclic process and it's not necessary that you, you cannot roll back to one phase so you can definitely roll back so from design you can go into the reporting phase and you can check the uh, previous um, learners data and see like what exactly is it that you know i can do better so basically what happens in there is that your training is aligning with your business needs and also what you're doing is that you're aligning your learners from the beginning to the business needs or to the learning objectives that you're going to design and those learning objectives will definitely be uh, linked to the business objectives that is in there so that is where the entire uh, reporting cycle or the data driven learning design comes into picture I'm really glad you mentioned about time by the way as your example that you were diving into because it's exactly what I was thinking about I'm trying to interpret something where before in the past I interpreted the uh different types of points of data with time as you know one thing but then after talking with because I actually talked to my learners I know shocking I talk to people what a weird weird concept but I talked to them more just to like help me understand what you actually mean because yeah. something's not clicking where I was thinking in my head that this problem type was only going to take people 30 minutes on average and some of them told me it took me 5 hours and I'm like Why is it taking you 5 hours? I did something horribly wrong if it is. And I'm you know I'm I keep on staring at all these different that we use um Qualtrics in my in my works so mm. using Qualtrics to collect this data. And I'm just keep on looking at it and I'm like looking at the report and I'm like something's wrong. Like what what is wrong? And finally from talking to the learners, I learned that I did not clearly specify how many words people should be writing for this assignment. Mm. So because of the way that it was laid out it was actually in a kind of like of a small frame so yeah. natu- so when i go to answer something in a small frame i'm like oh it's like a paragraph cuz like, it's not meant to be a paper it's in this tiny you know little, little frame and instead uh, we had people who are writing books 
who were just going into Word and like <laughs> copying and pasting pages upon pages. And I was like, no, like, oh my gosh. So after I learned that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to change that for going forwards. So that was just my example where I was just like, whoops, like I, you know, I didn't know what to do with, with this. And it took yeah. that extra strep to try to figure out. So time is clearly a huge factor. Um, any other topics though? I know there's, there's quite a bit. Any other topics though from that stance that we should also just kind of be aware of? Mm, also, I think uh, now since you've gone online, devices play a, play a very major role. So if, say, for example, you're giving a content online, but it has to be rendered on all three uh, devices. So you have to render it on desktop, on your mobile, and also on your tablet. So I think that has played a major role because for us, I think I've seen in both in education as well as in our uh, corporate learner, the only one thing that I've seen in common uh, is that uh, I think um, they use mobile a lot more now, especially once they've come online. Uh, they uh, they do have a lot of mobile uh, that they use. And also I've seen with kids as well from 7th to grade uh, 12th standard, 12th as in the high school graduate. So they, uh, they kind of have a lot of addiction towards the tablet. So even online uh, class that they have to take, they take it through a tablet uh, and no one's actually sitting on a desktop and viewing your course. So it has to be rendered on all three. So it's just that people who are there in um, like, say, uh, like the older generation, like the baby movers from uh, our times and then the Gen Z, uh, if you see, uh, it has to be rendered through all three uh, as of now. Otherwise, it would kind of be a little difficult. But for us, I think two years before COVID, uh, mobile was one and also desktop was another huge one because people would come into their office and they would usually schedule their time uh, for training um, in the office hours itself, nothing to take back home. But they also did take back their phones online and they had to like, you know, for example, if someone's taking a metro and uh, if an employee is going from one place to another and the metro is like, like say an hour long or like 45 minutes long so they would just complete their online course in there rather than sitting in the office and completing it or like say even during a cup of coffee and they would usually browse through that so it has to be rendered through all of them so the statistics what i can say is that now uh, after covid uh, desktop has uh, gone down to 48 uh, mobile and tablet has gone, tablet I think was 78 when I saw previously, and uh, I think mobile has gone up to 96%. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm trying to think about when's the last time I used my iPad. I'm like, mm, nope, it's definitely <laughs> the phone. <laughs> it's phone for everything. And I also specifically got like the largest screen version when everyone, I first got that, everyone was like making fun of me because they're like, you have a brick as a phone. I'm like, but I can see, I don't, I don't need my laptop anymore. Like this can literally do everything. And I'm really glad you mentioned that too, because I know that some folks, they have had to write different explanations to let the learners know about like how to um, use a platform if it's not able to be adapted. So for instance, for some of them, I know that when you're using a discussion board, a lovely discussion boards, sometimes it doesn't really work for a mobile friendly device. It, like it has to be a desktop. And then other times the discussion board could go on for literally forever. It just goes down the entire screen. There's no cutoff point. So that is an excellent recommendation because it's, it's so true. And sometimes unless if you, the user, or now we're talking more about UX kind of thing, but now so we, we go down the UX rabbit hole is that like, if you're not testing this out on all the different devices, you won't know either until, you know, people actually tell you where you're like, Oh, I didn't know. And, and same thing too, for different browsers and whatnot. Cause I, I have been an Apple person for mm -hmm. forever. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you the last time I touched anything, internet Explorer or even Firefox, which I know I can download, but like, I don't, and I don't use it. So yeah. yeah. So I have no idea what happens on that until I, test products so yep that's actually correct like the ones that you just said the apple and then um the uh, android sort of a thing that's there so apple uses safari right so it uses safari browser and uh, chrome or usually 
uh, you know, Explorer and all of that is used on Windows. So we do get a lot of uh, mismatch in there. So even if you're using like the highest level of X API over in there, since Apple has a lot of control, uh, security control that's in there. So that cookies issue, we didn't know in one of the cases uh, that it would kind of create this cookies issue for us. And uh, what we just did was like, we just implemented that X API. Like we were so excited, like, yeah, X API, let's do it, let's do it. And we just implemented that X API, but we never kept in mind that, okay, Safari has this cookies issue and you're supposed to enable the cookies issue. But that was that kind of became like a challenge for us because none of the learners took the course because most of them were Apple users and they were Safari users. So none of them, like almost like what we invested, like some dollars, like thousand, thousand five hundred dollars in it. And then none of them used it. And then we were like, kind of like thinking like, why is it that they were not using? Then there was this one student who was really brave. And he said that, ma'am, you know what? We cannot use it because we are getting this error here. <laughs> it says... <laughs> It says that uh, you have to enable cookies. I don't know what is cookies. You please explain what is cookies. Then we had to go back to the LMS and then we had to say that this is the document for enabling the cookies. Please ask your parents to enable it for you. So that was an issue. I would definitely do it. <laughs> I would slightly alter the learning experience if you can't, you know, do anything. Minor, minor details there. It, it's yeah. it's fine. So moving on from learning analytics, the final thing, but I, and you touched upon a little bit of this, but I'd love to kind of go further down this because now we're really going into instructional design land is that in the article, you mentioned about how EDM helps uh, address certain questions related to instructional design practices and strategies, really just in order to make everything more learner centric. And you've talked about a little bit as far as for how EDM does inform design, but can you share any more examples just about this of really just how everything with instructional design and EDM should be, should be playing nice and coming together? Uh, yeah. So there's one, okay. So one thing with EDM and instructional designing is that, so it, uh, so when you say that you're an EDM user and when you say that you're an instructional designer, it's just that you're using, you're using this entire um, data-driven learner strategy, maybe, uh, like just for it. So uh, you're using that entire data-driven strategy just to uh, make your learning more quantifiable and more measurable in terms of data. So uh, it's like the entire strategy depends on what the data says. So for example, if say, if one of the course content has got learning objectives and the stakeholder comes back to you and says that, see, we need a learning objective page here. But then you go back to the stakeholder and you say that no one's actually spending time on this learning objective. You're just spending, wasting a lot of time just doing this learning objective page, which is not of any help to the learner as well as uh, to you know whoever is seeing it. So what we do is that we go back with that data. So your uh, teaching or your learning strategy is not just backed by what you think intuitively. Uh, it's basically backed by that entire data uh, that is there in place. So one uh, case study or one example that I could uh, give you as of now of my head is that uh, we had a series of videos uh, for one of the courses. And that was supposed to be the best course uh, in the uh, in the entire LMS that was supposed to be the best course because we had uh, invested a lot into the video making part of it. We are not invested much into the reading part or writing part or nothing much with the clickable elements, which is just a series of 10 minute video. And the entire course, I think, had six videos. So it lasted for about 60 minutes or so. So it was like one hour continuous stretch of videos, nothing in between. Just in the end, you would, uh, the learner would get like, say, one quiz uh, in the end just to check how his understanding is going and what is happening throughout the entire course. So what happened through that entire video and that entire one hour stretch was that what we saw was that after two videos, the learner paused and then there was a drop off. Uh, there was a pause. So basically, there would be like 20 minutes on our, uh, on our logs, how we would see that uh, there would be just 20 minutes first. And then there would be a pause of about 30 minutes and then there would be a drop off after that. And then the learner would log in again, like say after two to three days from that 20 minute, there would be again another continuation and then again a drop off. So this kind of drop off, 
initially that 20 minutes was engaging because the content was engaging because it was just an introductory content that was in there and obviously if you are learning something like an ai or you know data science or something like that like 3d printing as you said it's very interesting when someone introduces something uh, that concept to you rather than um, you know uh, you um, um, you kind of uh, uh, implementing it uh, on your own. So what happens was that since it was very engaging the first 20 minutes, so a learner would sit through that 20 minutes stretch uh, on there and then he would he or she would drop off. So this was kind of, this was the repeating pattern that we saw. And what we did was that we kind of analyzed this pattern and we said that like, why is it for every batch? So we would divide uh, them into batches. So why is it for every batch that this is dropping off? Like exactly at 20th minute, why is it dropping off? And then when we actually sat and analyzed, and as you said, we went back to our learners and we did like, you know, why, why are you dropping off at this point? Is there any issue with the course that you're, you're facing or is there anything? So what had happened was that the first 20 minute was just theory. And then later on came the coding part. And in coding part, you just cannot see a video for 10 minutes on coding until and unless you implement something on a sandbox environment. So that is where we kind of figured out, okay, this was this is wrong. This is completely wrong. You cannot just sit through a video for uh, like say 20 minutes and then, you know, uh, just give them coding stuff. So what we did was that we had the 20 minute video in the beginning. So we divided that, I think it was seven and seven. Uh, so the first seven minute was introductory and then we gave them a sandbox environment on our uh, on our LMS, uh, which says that, you know, now you have learned this. Why don't you solve this ahead as of now? So we would give them coding questions uh, in there and then go on to the next topic and then give them coding questions again. So basically what was happening was that from 60 minutes. We shortened it to, I think, seven, seven into three, uh, so 24 minutes. So basically, it was just half an hour. And then the rest of it was for their coding. So how much of a time they take for coding uh, is up to them. It's on the learners. And in case they wanted to reach out to the, uh, you know, instructor or, you know, whoever they needed help with, they had an email ID uh, over in there. So this is the most creative that we could get with the data that was available. But yeah, we do have chatbots and stuff like that now. But then that time, this is pretty creative, wherein we just give them an email ID and they would drop in an email. And the ability was that when you click on that email ID, the email would pop up. So that was the best that we could do uh, at that time. And then what, what happened was that uh, not only did the drop-off rates come down, it, even the retention rates kind of increased uh, because, uh, you know, they were showing their performances on the sandbox environment or in the coding environment that was in there. So I think uh, this this is the kind of thing that the data will usually drive you towards. And there were also a few other things which we saw with corporate learners, wherein they would sit for like five days straight of eight hours of training every day uh, and just learn like AI. Uh, AI uh, day one would be like no coding, nothing. They would just sit and learn what exactly is AI. They would be given textbooks. Uh, so this is your textbook. This is how you got to learn. Go home and implement whatever it is. If they implement, they implement. If not, they do not implement. So what we also learned throughout this research was that a lot, okay, again, you may contradict me on this, uh, but then, uh, I mean, anyone could contradict me on this because we had a lot of, uh, um, you know, tough time convincing the uh, stakeholders as well, uh, saying that higher the effort, learning is less. So the more efforts you put in, learning was less for the corporate learners. So what happened was that uh, while um, while they were giving exams or while they were like exams as in assignments and then taking up certifications and all of that. So for them, uh, their effort was calculated in terms of how they were sitting through the course. So if someone is really active uh, in the ILT class, like they were like, hey, what is this question? What is that? What is this? And all of that. So then that would be their performance gauge. But then the same person who's asking so many questions did not do well uh, at the end of the course. Similarly, what happened with our online courses was that when we went in and we said that, you know, you are putting in higher efforts for quiz one, two, three, four, and eight, until eight, until quiz two, the performances were good. But then after quiz two onwards was where the performances started declining because we had given them a DIY project sort of a thing. Uh, and in the eighth quiz was where we just saw like two or three members who would clear that entire course. And that was the kind of effort that they put in in the end of it. But then from one to whatever seven that was there, 
they didn't uh, perform that well. It was just in the eighth part of it is when they performed really well. So that's where we came up with this um, theory of, you know, higher the effort doesn't mean uh, you have better learning sort of a thing. That was really tough to wrap my head around. So, cause now, cause now of course, like as an instructor, I'm like, well, what could I have done? Could I provide more support? Could I have, done, you know, like what, what potential additional steps could we take to try to do that? But all obviously at the same time too, understanding about there's only so much time in the day, the results are expected basically yesterday and like literally any of these types of different trainings. So there's always these different factors that I'm sure you've already thought about of what you can and cannot do within the budget, the scope. You know, timeline, you name it, there's always yes. some parameters <laughs> that you're, you're stuck in, you know, so yeah. that's, that's actually really interesting. So with that, and the last question I kind of wanted to just ask you about, um, which actually segues very well into that, it's more about when you have the lack of ability to do something, mm -hmm. you're still trying to obviously go through everything, but let's say either your ability is lacking as far as for collecting the data or processing or, you know, whatever it is. Is there another way to obtain and try to use this information when you have so many different barriers that you might be facing? Yeah, I think that's the challenge uh, with this uh, is uh, is that like you require everything real time, but there are a few things that you could do like offline as well. If you if you do not have a proper infrastructure or you know you do not have an LMS in place, but uh, if you have normal Office three sixty five and you have like Google Sheets, you have Excel. And if say your number is like say 10 students, 10 learners, I mean, that should that's that should be it. So I think, uh, you know, you just need to have an Excel. If you have Google Forms, that's good because Google Forms does give you data. So if say, if you're telling like from what scale to what scale you like it, or from, you know, what time to what time the learners are sitting through my course, and then you give them like options, Google Forms does generate uh, data. So in case you do not have any of like the LMS and then, you know, you don't know anything else. So I think those two are like the go-to tools, which I use uh, in case I don't have anything online. And uh, the other uh, thing that I use is Mentimeter. I mean, this, uh, uh, there is a, a thing known as Mentimeter. It's an online software, but it does give us, uh, you know, it's usually used for engaging uh, students online but I use it to collect data as well. So if um, say, suppose I have to, for design thinking, if I have to say, I need to collect data on how exactly the students are empathizing with a customer, or you know, if they are given some kind of empathy interviews, and then you know, you're saying that, how do you exactly empathize with them? So that is where your uh, Mentimeter comes into picture and you can kind of send out uh, those links online and you can collect that data online itself. So these are a few tools which you could use uh, in case you do not have a proper LMS or an LRS in place until and unless it's been set up. I think Excel is the best um, until now. Offline, Excel. <laughs> Excel for any data. I agree with you 100%. I use Excel for everything. Google Sheets, you name it. Like those, those are my jam. That's, that's what I use for yeah. everything. So I understand completely. <laughs> I, I do. There was an entire data team I used to work with at another university. And while they generated the report, they then gave it to you over into Excel. I mean, you could you could pick and choose what you wanted to do and what exactly you're going to do for a strategy, for outreach, and then, you know, like all those different things of that nature too. So yeah. I understand. I totally get it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and enlightening us about a uh, number of things with data. And I certainly learned a thing or two this evening. So it's been absolutely awesome to have you on. For everyone else who wants to be able to follow along with you, where can they go to connect with you and learn more it is of what you do? Um, I think the best possible thing would be LinkedIn <laughs> as of now. So LinkedIn is the best possible thing. So you can they could connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, also my blogs that are in there on my website, maybe they could leave a comment in there or two. I think that should work. Wonderful. I will put down all the links in the show notes as always. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast once again. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for the invite, by the way. Samurdi, thank you for coming on the show once again, folks. Be sure to connect with her on LinkedIn and read her blog posts. Um, they're beautiful looking, by the way, too. She did a fantastic job with the aesthetics of everything. Very easy to follow and to read. Absolutely check out those things. Both of the links are down below in the show notes to be able to connect for her on LinkedIn and to read all of her work. If you enjoyed today's episode, share this podcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. If you haven't already, connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook and check out my YouTube channel. 
the YouTube channel is almost at a thousand subscribers. I'm still in complete disbelief and shock seeing that number. Uh, so help me hit that milestone. Help me hit the 1000 and subscribe if you haven't yet so far. If you're looking for a group of learning nerds to talk all about things instructional design related, check out the link to our Facebook group called Instructional Design Institute Community. As always, folks, your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and uh, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever else you are uh, listening to this podcast right now. All of those reviews are so, so appreciated. Thank you for taking the time to write those. I read all of them, uh, every single one. So I really appreciate that. But hey, folks, that is all I have for you today. Stay nerdy out there, and I'll talk to you next time.